Hello, my name is Daniel, and I'm playing one of my favorite games ever made. Let me show you a little hype intro I made for this video. Here, watch this. Here is a game that allows you to make people disabled. Summon gods down to do your bidding and deep fry your foes. Where you can literally tell people they're going to die and they will three turns later. It is absolutely fascinating to me that I have such a strong bond with a game that is older than even myself. This game originally released in 1997. So if it looks old, it is. This game is old as hell. But don't let that put any unease on you. This is a legendary title, I must assure you. You've quite a mouth on you, princess. <sighs> I remember watching my old man play this back when I was too young and stupid to play strategy games for myself. Cold mornings in the living room, sitting in absolute awe of all these mechanics and characters I, I didn't understand in the slightest, but loved it nonetheless. And there's probably a lot of things that you don't understand if you're not too familiar with this game, like... Why is everyone walking in place? Isn't that kind of goofy? And yes, it is. But I feel it brings life to these battles in a way that is hard to explain. There are a few instances where characters will stop walking in place, and it does a great job of placing emphasis on things like spell casting or being under the effects of spells like stop or stone. Even low health units will stop the walking animation to kneel over to show that they are severely injured, which I, translates well I feel to them being worn down from attacks at a glance. So yeah, it is silly at first, but I feel it's not out of place at all for this game. And another thing you might notice later on is, where the hell is everyone's noses? I guess they were running too, but not in place. <laughs> They have released this game on a few things. The original PlayStation version, a new version called War of the Lions that adds a bunch of cool stuff on the PlayStation Portable, and even a solid mobile one too. And I have played all of them for an absolutely obscene amount of time because... This game is so with the shits. I can't even tell you about it to do it proper justice. But here I am playing an emulated version of the PSP I've rigged up on my little PC here while using my Xbox One controller. For real though, and on God and all that, if you have not had the pleasure of playing this game yet, please go give it a shot right now. Throw it on top of the backlog for real. And if you watch some of this video and go, hey, that looks kinda neat, it is. So d drop my video and go play it. But like, come back after you beat it, please. But if you're still down to just watch me beat this ancient game solo, meaning just one character, a strategy game with very fine-tuned mechanics that I'm about to absolutely defile and manipulate, then get comfortable. For those who have played this game before, prepare to be disgusted and impressed. For those who haven't played this game before, <laughs> prepare to be terrified and confused. We start the game with a man named Arizalem, a scholar. He has recently found texts that tell a different story about the War of the Lions and Alita Hyrule, who emerged as a uniter and hero from the darkness of those times. This game is formatted as him telling it to us from these hidden texts he has recently found. These newfound texts hidden by the church are called the Durai Papers, and they tell us this very different story about the true hero, and we will learn how his name got erased from history, and how he was labeled as a heretic.
we are given a fantastic scene of a group of knights riding to a monastery. A particularly gallant looking one is Delita himself, donned in gold and red armor. They approach the monastery where Ramza and a few other important characters are located, most notably the princess, Ovelia. Our first real text spoken in the story is by Ovelia herself. She is in prayer at this monastery, and it is a very peaceful scene, to be sure. It is not long before this peace is disturbed by Sir Gafgarian and our main character Ramza in tow. Gafgarian is induced quite well as far as side characters go. From his very first lines, you get an excellent feel for him alongside his portrait, a grizzled old warrior working for money and concerned for little else, not even willing to use proper manners before the princess herself. They are assumedly hired here to help safeguard this princess. Shortly after this exchange, we see a knight enter the monastery. It would seem that we are under attack by the Lions of the South, by Duke Galtana's troops, or so it would seem. This leads to our first fight in the game. We get to see a lot happen here, and it makes a good impression that Gafgarian is a ruthless and dangerous man able to attack and heal in the same move. There is little the player can do here to alter this fight unless they really, really try, but it serves as a great teaching tool without forcing you through a tutorial, and I really appreciate this game for the hands-off teaching it does here. During this fight, you can learn that chemists heal, <laughs> range units such as archers exist and can attack from afar, and that knights are able to break equipment too, and a lot more. For some people, the gears might already be turning on how they can make their team, but as you know, this will be a solo run for us. After this fight, we hear Princess Ovelia is in trouble, and we see a familiar face is the cause of it. Truly him? This familiar face is one Ramza knows too well. It's his childhood friend, Delita. And now, we will soon learn how they got to where they are currently in life. After this begins a lengthy flashback from before the kidnapping takes place. We see them here, both as cadets in a military academy, as peers and lifelong friends, but not as equals regarding nobility. Among a few other squires and such, Soon, we see the orders that send us to the first and hardest mission of the entire playthrough, and the killer of any solo run. It might be a little early to claim that this is the hardest mission you might think, but trust me, every mission past this one will only get much easier. This nightmare we are about to walk into is a 2v7, so just Rams and Delita. And, to make it worse, you can't even control Delita, as he is a guest in this battle. Now let me get personal with this. Remember earlier in the video when I told you I was like, too dumb to play this game back then? Well, before this fight, you get access to the formation lineup or whatever. And you can add like 5 more units even to make this fight even. And it becomes really easy, but to do that, you need to press the triggers to cycle through your party members to access them and actually add them to the fight. I was too dumb to know that, so I did, for the longest time, try and beat this with just Rams and Delita, not knowing I could add more units. 
The same ones you see in the military academy before this actually. You can add to this fight for assistance. But here I am for the sake of the challenge, fighting this battle solo. So, this fight has a lot going on for it, and since it's just the two of us, you'll have to get very lucky, but it is possible to win it. It's just really, really hard. There's a few things that are going to dictate how this goes, like sign compatibility. Your little birthday dictates how much damage you do to the other person and how much you heal them in certain situations. And I'm not a nerd, so I don't know them all by heart, but basically, I'm at the mercy of Delita's AI and the compatibility of the signs, since it's random for each time for everyone except Rams and Delita, of course. The main thing we want to see here in the beginning is that the first choir gets killed on the first or at least the second turn. If not, this whole thing falls apart and we get swarmed. The main issue is, if we do too much damage that doesn't kill the squire, the chemist is just going to heal him, making it impossible to kill him for the second turn. If we do too little damage, we're not going to be able to kill him and we're going to get swarmed still anyway. So we can get an idea on what the end of the fight is going to look like just by the first few turns. Knowing this, past being able to kill the first squire, we basically want to follow Delita's lead and attack whoever he attacks to keep the streak going. This fight alone took me about two hours to complete, or more like two hours to get lucky enough to complete it. But I did manage to do it as you see. The start of this went perfect. Doing just enough damage to kill the squire on the second turn, we started off looking pretty promising. The leader then gets a mean ass hit on the next opponent due to a good birth sign roll and compatibility between them. And by following his lead, we send this loser straight to hell on our second turn. Even with this amazing start, I still took a few hits, but then Delita got another huge hit on the next squire, and again, following his lead, we were able to kill another unit, only leaving two more left. Despite being low at health, this last squire decides to throw the game hard here by throwing a stone rather than just choosing to finish me off with a melee attack almost handing us the win basically. The game must have been feeling bad for me at this point. Then, the leader the homie that he is, uses chant. I got you homie! After that, I got right up in this man's ass with 20 damage. And, this didn't trigger the chemist to heal him, so the chemist just wasted a turn not healing him basically. But, the squire did retaliate, but this one had a dagger equipped rather than a longsword, so his damage was not that great. After that, Delita chose to attack the chemist rather than finishing off the squire I'm currently fighting. And this could have lost us the run because if I die, he won't be able to kill the chemist by himself because of their bad sign compatibility and uh, the chemist's infinite potions. After this, I decide to attack the squire again and run past Delita so they can't attack me back and it ends up working. This loser throws the game by throwing another stone at the leader hits me with another chant, putting us both back in the green, and then the chemist here punches me in the nuts for about 3 testicular damage. I beat his damage slightly on my next turn, and now we are closer to victory, but not before another issue arises. One of the enemy units killed earlier turns into a crystal, meaning if someone manages to move to it and collect it, they get full health and the squire I didn't finish off earlier runs straight for it on his next turn, and then throws another rock at me for good measure. Then, Delita following my lead for once, finishes off the chemist I hit earlier, putting us at an almost unlosable advantage. With the next turn, I'm able to collect the crystal, and I'm back at full health. And then, with the next turn, I claim victory. After about two hours of attempting this madness, With this brutal encounter out of the way, 
the gates have just flown open to the path of absolute power and destruction, and I readily fly into it, like a pit bull into a nursery. But first, I save my game, so I will never have to do that shit again. First thing I need to do is get rid of all the party members with the exception of Delita. Since you can't actually fire guest party members, since they play critical roles during story missions, but you cannot control guest party members or use them in regular encounters. So with that, at no point in this run will I ever control a unit that is not Ramza himself. Going into the party management tab, I swiftly unequip the gear off of everyone, and then I fire each and every one of them, sending them promptly to the curb. When you go to dismiss people in this game, they even have uh, cool lines of dialogue trying to get you to change their mind and make you feel bad about it and uh, most of the time it works. And funny enough, Rams and Alita have unique dialogue for trying to dismiss them since you can't get rid of them for story reasons. After this, I go straight into the outfitters and sell all of the literal clothes I just took off of everyone's backs to make some capital and buy some gamer potions. And then I learn a very very important skill, exclusive to Ramza and very few others called Tailwind. This next cutscene has Ramza's actual father straight up die, but some of his final words we will see Ramza truly takes to heart throughout the story, especially the last one here. I'm over here stroking my dick, I got lotion on my dick right now, I'm just stroking my sh With that, we are on our second real mission of the game where we encounter a stranger being beset by brigands. We are given a choice for this battle. We can prioritize saving the captive or defeating the brigade. If we pick option two, we will fail the fight if the stranger gets KO'd. So if we choose this one, the fight will be basically unwinnable. So with that, I choose the morally correct choice to ignore his safety. After this, Delita says something that becomes depressively ironic at the end of this chapter due to this choice. This fight is exceedingly simple, even with one actual real character. I pretty much just sit in the corner and spam the Tailwind ability, which is absolutely busted, and is the only reason I'm going to be able to do what I'm going to do so effectively with only one character later on. To simplify the skill, every time I use it, I get experience and job points very easily, which is pretty good, but it also has the effect of making me faster, which pretty much gives me more turns. On the extreme side of the scale, I can get up to 5 turns in a row for the rest of the battle if I abuse this hard enough. For this fight, Delita is pretty much able to hold his own quite well just with the potion skill I gave him for quite a while, and after getting a healthy amount of experience, I decide to end the fight before it gets out of hand. Fuck out of here and go to the <laughs> After the battle, we see that the man we rescued is named Argath. A fellow highborn squire, just as Ramza is. Upon learning that Ramza comes from a very prestigious household, he reveals that the head of his house has been captured and begs Ramza for assistance in rescuing him. Afterwards, the three head back home, and not much longer, they are being congratulated by Dystarg, one of Ramza's brothers, and assured that a rescue party will be sent for the head of Argath's household. Afterwards, they find themselves stuck on guard duty within the safety of the castle's walls. During this, we are introduced to some very important minor characters, the sisters of Ramza and Delita, and then we are informed by Zalbag, the other older brother of Ramza, that they have received a ransom note from the Corpse Brigade, the guys in green that we've been fighting pretty much. Zalbag tips us off to search the town of Dorder, and the trio is off again. With this next story battle, I should explain the main difference between random encounters and story missions. The reason I didn't spend the last fight leveling myself to 99, even though I could have pretty easily done that, is that random encounters scale to your unit's levels, and some of the very few story ones that feature random enemies like this current fight do as well. Here you can see that I am level 7, and so are a few of the enemies here, while Aragath and Delita are much lower. This can create problems like where your current equipment does not match your current enemies, no, most notably the monsters. 
Monsters don't use swords or armor, so they just get a ton of natural health and damage to make up for it. And uh, they will break you in half if you overlevel and then get into the wrong fights. I'm about to blow. No. But there is another side of the spectrum. Most story encounters are at fixed levels, so if you did grind to level 99 in your first fight, where like where you uh, rescue Urgath, you can end up fighting enemies up to 80 to 70 levels below you in most of the beginning fights, making these fights hilariously easy, even with just one character. With this fight, it got a little difficult as you can see, because my homies over here got absolutely destroyed in like two turns, leaving me alone to fight six enemies, and it looked like running around and spamming Tailwind was not going to work on this attempt. This was the wrong choice, and I got cornered for it. I did try and put up a fight, but I was still brutally booty blasted big time for my efforts. Second time I tried to be more active in the fight and did get demonically demolished due to damage I took, leaving me dead. This third attempt, I did nothing but spam Tailwind and Focus, which Focus increases your attack power each time you use it. It's like Tailwind, but for trying to do 999 damage. By barely staying out of reach of the enemy units, I was able to pick up some serious steam and end up getting two turns in a row and start winning the fight due to this, while my two lazy friends slept the entire time basically. Winning this fight allows me to unlock the Monk job, the strongest one in the game as far as I'm concerned, and I immediately switch to it to start leveling it up so I can unlock other jobs. Advanced jobs need you to level up previous ones to get further down the tree, but there's one little issue with all this. The one I want the most also requires the most work. How much work? Well, let me show you. For the Dark Knight class, you need to master the knight class and black mage classes, meaning you unlock all the things available for that class. On top of that, you also must reach level 8 with the following classes as well. Samurai, Dragoon, Geomancer, and Ninja. You also have to unlock these classes in the first place, so you can go ahead and add all of their unlock requirements to this list as well. And then the spicy part. The unit that is unlocking the Dark Knight job must have at least 20 confirmed killed enemies, meaning they have to be the one that deals the blow that knocks them out, and then three turns must pass, allowing them to crystallize or turn into a chest, leaving that unit dead dead. But don't worry, I should tell you I have grinded this job out like three times in my life, and here I am about to do it a fourth time. But this time, it will be solo. Upon reaching Dorter, we see two men, and the cooler looking one is looking for information and isn't taking no for an answer. Then, after seeing me show up over level to hell, he flees the scene, and I get to work cranking Tailwind. Shortly into the fight, Delita remembers who the man who fled is. He recognizes him as Weegraf, the leader of the Corpse Brigade. Soon, I reach my first victim and deliver a posterior fisting that would make any laxative blush. This is because I have about 6 to 7 levels on these guys. Since this is a scripted story fight, it will be easy to level up the monk class during it. Once they start closing in, this nerd starts trying to cast some magic shit at me and I show him a much cooler spell I invented to stop spells from being cast. <laughs> then this other guy must have been skeptical on its efficiency, so I prove it is reliable a second time shutting down yet a second spell. Soon after, it's just me and the knight we saw getting manhandled, so I'm not too worried about him. I'm so not worried, I spend the rest of this fight scampering around and cranking up my levels. So much that I leave this fight at level 18. About 7 more levels uh, than I was when I walked into this fight as. 
When I'm done, I do the meanest back shot of all history of 999 damage to this dude, guaranteeing he will never walk again. After this, we interrogate the man that was just interrogated by Weegraf and was dealt 999 damage to. So he is having the worst day ever pretty much. But it will get worse, as Aragath is leading this second interrogation. Before long, we are given the same information that Weegraf was, and now we know the location of our next battle. After this, I switched to the night job to start leveling that one up, one of the ones we have to master, and I did do two random encounters before this next fight, and they went pretty well, due to the new OP monk skills I unlocked due to the last fight, but the monk skills will only carry me so far, so I try not to overdo it. I end up getting to level 22 from these two random fights I did. Our next story mission has us encounter a pretty competent fighting force standing between us and the Marquis held hostage. Too bad I have about 18 levels on these guys, so you can guess how this will end for them. Nothing too special happens in this fight, but while making sure everyone turns into a crystal, I did get one of the knight skills I needed to master it for free. But yet again, I'm left as the only one standing upright at the end of the battle. Here we see why Weegraf wanted to find Gustav, one of his comrades that had kidnapped the Marquis behind his back seemingly for money, leading to the exchange that had him kill them. Our trio barges in in the aftermath and Weegraf hands us back the Marquis in exchange for his freedom. And with that, the head of Aragas House, aka Discount Ben Sephiroth, is finally rescued. After this, I did another small random encounter and... <laughs> Am I starting to feel the levels catch up to me despite this being a small fight with easy enemies? But this allowed me to finally master the night job, a decent step towards a daunting list of requirements for the real job I seek. Back home, we are before Lord Dystard. Despite us rescuing the Marquis, is seemingly more displeased with the fact that we ended up leaving our post. Duke Larg has been listening from outside and comes in to put an end to the scolding and begins to commend us instead. With this, we are given another mission to attack the Corpse Brigade, since we have proved so useful. We then learn that the kidnapping was staged by they themselves, and since the man Gustav, the one we graph clowned on, did the kidnapping in their backyard, they ended up indirectly undoing it, but also looking good at least in doing so. This is only some of the deceit we will see from the nobility going forward. Next, I start to level up the chemist job, but this one with the three chocobos was unwinnable, so I end up going to the next story mission to level up the chemist instead. Here, we are fighting an important woman. This is Weegraf's sister. I'm not gonna lie, this fight was getting pretty fucking sketchy since I didn't have any good fighting skills and these two white mages kept reviving everyone, but I did have the Tailwind ability, and it was only a matter of time before the white mages ran out of juice to revive their allies. This fight got me the experience I needed for the chemist to unlock the mage classes. Having been defeated, Maluda starts to paint upon Ramza this visage of a monster and surrenders herself immediately to death. This is the first time Ramza starts to question the big things. Why does this woman hate him so fiercely? The reason becomes obvious with Argath. She hates what he represents, and that being the nobility and its abuse. Argath is an excellent example of this. He is so ignorant that he cannot find an ounce of empathy for this poor woman, but Delita can. He claims he cannot see this woman as their enemy, and with this, Argath immediately accuses Delita of betraying them. With this banter, 
Maluda curses them and is off. Back at home, we see the Corpse Brigade is attacking with the intention of killing Dysodar. But when they cannot finish him, in a panic, they kidnap who they can. And sadly, this happens to be Tetra, Lolita's sister. Upon returning, we see Dystar recovering from his wounds. He states as soon as they figure out where the hideout of the Corpse Brigade is, they are to raise it to the ground. But then, when asked about Tetra, Dystarg assures us that measures have been taken and that we are actually just waiting on her safe return before the attack. This exchange even ends with him comparing her as a sister to him. Afterwards, Delita is mad as hell, with nothing to do about it but wait. Then Aragath arrives, and tells us not to believe a word of what Dysodar just said, completely on the premise that Delita's sister is just a commoner. This, understandably, infuriates an already pissed off Delita, and when asked about it, he doubles down, claiming that the life of one commoner will not halt an army's assault. The last two comments he just made to us, to Delita, as vicious and cruel as they might sound, are almost spoken as common sense coming from Argath here. Lita will have none of it. After striking Argath, Argath goes to insults, mostly aimed at Delita's commoner status. With his last comment, Delita says not everyone that is nobility is as ill-bred as him, citing Ramza as his example against this, and leaves. For this, Ramza tells Argath to get the hell out, basically, but not before he reveals some chilling information. His brother told him that the Corpse Brigade's HQ is located at Fort Zykadin, which means two things. Ramza's brother just lied to them, or Argath can tell the future. Right after this, I level up the Archer class with an easy battle encounter. And after another 15 minute session of running around spamming Tailwind, I'm slightly closer to my goal. And after this fight, I'm able to jump to the thief job. And after this, we go into our next battle against a very familiar face. But this time, without Argath. As soon as he has the chance, he pleads for his sister's safe return. But, in an ironic retort, Meluda says that no amount of howling will set his sister free and calls Delita nobility, which is far from the truth as we know very well, especially with our last exchange we saw. Here, I get to use my spell cancelling technique yet again, and even a second time against a more exotic spellcaster. As my speed starts to build up, I'm able to start taking out units and win the fight, and before we know it, we graph sister lays slain. After this fight, I'm able to learn the Move 2 skill, which is super useful for fleeing and spamming Tailwind, and then I jump into the Black Mage job, which will be the hardest of all to master. Next, we see Weegraf and some of his brigade, and also Tetra. Weegraf is confused that yet again his forces are kidnapping people, but this time they had no choice, and it may be the ticket to saving their lives believing Tetra to be nobility still. Wegraf is at the end of his rope here, and knows with the failed attack on Dice Star, they do not have much time. They could run again, but then they would also lose yet again, as they always have. With this, he has delivered grave news.
Despite hearing that his sister has just been killed and that her killers are approaching them, he still orders that Tidra be left unharmed before going out to meet us. But Gragoroth has other plans, sadly, and he does not want to lose his bargaining chip. Next fight here is most players' real wake-up call. It's the, hey, I hope you have your shit together and understand the game somewhat. I didn't realize this was the next fight, or I probably would have not picked Black Mage as the job I have currently, but here I am with a hard to use class, fighting a mean ass battle against an angry ass Weegraf, and boy he is not happy to see us. I do the only thing I know how, and start spamming Tailwind. Here, Delita begins again to request the release of his sister, and yet again, Delita and his sister are claimed to be nobility, but this time, Rams is able to clear up this error. Regraf says they do plan to release her, but first, they have a score to settle, and if they do see her, they'll have to come out of this fight alive, and Regraf is so fucking badass. Here we also see well, that Weegraf is also dangerous. He wields holy sword skills, and for most players, these skills are enough to outright kill most of their party members in a single blow. As we see Delita here take a mean ass hit and almost die to one. Not long after, I end up getting chased into a corner, and not expecting to win this fight, I just start slinging magic like my life depends on it. And in this corner, Ramza tries to defuse Weegraf, but he knows all too better not to trust the nobility, especially the like of the brothers of Ramza. With another cast, I end up beating this fight somehow, and we graph departs before revealing to Ramza that Gustav was under the orders of his own brother, Dysdar to kidnap the Marquis all along. And this is most likely why he tried to kill him in the event that ended up seeing Teacher kidnapped when he failed. Wegraf runs off to fight another day, leaving Ramza confused and conflicted. Well, see you later. Afterwards, it seems Wegraf's orders were indeed ignored by Gagaroth, and the mill has not a soul in it. Teacher was taken with them to the fort after all, and now, they make their way to said fort, where we will find out if our brother's words were true or not. Now, before I planned to unlock the Dark Knight class before this fight happened, but I guess I got ahead of myself and I was just having a lot of fun, so I wasn't really paying attention. So, the first thing I do is finish the Black Mage. The second one I need to master in order to unlock the Dark Knight. And this one actually took two fights because during this first one, I actually ran out of speed and attack to actually boost, so I stopped getting experience points for the Focus and Tailwind. And I was so desperate to finish leveling up this job in one fight that I started using Chant on this goblin to keep getting experience and I fucking killed myself wasting like this probably was like an hour almost of just running around and leveling up you see it I really did this so after redoing that fight and completing a second one I ended up getting all the points I needed to get the black mage mastered taking a huge chunk of work needed out of our goal then I went on to the dragoon job one of the jobs I need to get to level 8, and at this point in the story, they don't even sell spears for me to use in the shop inventory, so I'll be going barehanded and relying completely on the focus and tailwind skills once again. With the help of the move 2 skill, kiting around the enemies while charging up is much easier, but sometimes they do land a hit. If I die at any point during one of these attempts, especially later in when I'm like starting to level up, I pretty much lose all the effort for the whole fight, so this can be a pretty nerve-wracking endeavor. Thankfully, the Dragoon job goes pretty well, and I'm off to the Geomancer job. And near the end of it, 
I get counterattacked by this skeleton, and I literally survive with one fucking health to my name. Thankfully, this means I don't have to redo the whole fight. The next up is the ninja class to reach level 8 in. I should tell you, the ninja has some awesome abilities, most notably being able to attack twice in the same turn. If you put this on a monk, you can wreck some serious shit. But as I was leveling up the ninja, my luck seemed to run out during this fight and I got my shit zapped hardcore. And this bitch even danced on me afterwards. Then it literally happened again. I'm level 72 at this point and shit is starting to hurt really bad so mistakes are getting pretty costly. And then it happened again but this time with a chocobo and I really gotta say I'm flying pretty close to the sun because these random encounters are getting mean. So with the third time I took a more forceful approach and I started throwing knives and it worked pretty well thankfully. With the ninja job at level 8, the last one left is the samurai, and thankfully I got a very easy fight, so level 8 came fast for this job. Ramza Squire abilities have carried me all the way to victory more or less. Despite everything being such a high level, I was able to brute force my way into the dark knight job sickeningly early, and by myself at that. Lord have mercy I'm about to bust! Been at this for 10 hours and 25 minutes, it says. <laughs> There's one last skill I should mention that I picked up during this leveling up spree, and it will make this solo run a lot easier. And that skill is called Shiahadori. And if you know, you know. Basically, this skill makes it to where you're essentially invincible to all but a few forms of attacks. It gives you the ability to dodge all melee and ranged attacks with the equivalent of your bravery as that chance to dodge. And Ramza has 72 bravery. That means at a base rate, most attacks are only going to have a 28% chance to hit me. And did I mention I can also raise my bravery to increase this chance permanently? Right now, the only thing I really have to worry about is magic and a good chunk of the monster skills. Everything else, I have an unfair chance to just swat away. But let me tell you about the Dark Knight skills though. Sanguine Sword, that do anything for you? Well, you remember our friend Gafgarian from the first fight? Remember how he did that shit where he attacks and heals in the same turn? Well, guess who can do that now? Me. And that ain't it. You know how mages need magic to cast spells? Well, let's take Sanguine Sword and make it siphon magic. You know what we call that? We call that Infernal Strike. And now you can blue ball mages before they can even cast anything at you. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's not supposed to. I know what's wrong with it. Ain't got no gas in it. What else? Oh yeah, Crushing Blow. AKA Black Hole Get Fucked. One of my favorite moves in the game. We also got some spicy moves, it don't end there. I'm talking Abyssal Blade. Got any health to spare? Want to hit everyone in front of you for a little bit of it? Then I have a move for you, my friend. But what if you're surrounded by idiots that can't hit you because you have sheer Hidori and they're still gonna take that 1% chance to land a blow? Well, how about we take a little bit more health and make it into one big AoE of fuck you and your entire family. And you know what? I'm gonna include the dog too, since no one is safe from me with this diabolical moveset. And with that out of the way, we're pretty much ready to set forth to Fort Zykadin. Upon arriving at the fort, we see all that is left of the corpse brigade here is Gagaroth and his bargaining chip, Titra. Down below, we see Argath and our brother Zalbag, and not long afterwards, Ramza and Alita arrive to watch this scene unfold firsthand.
Under Zalbag's orders, Ergeth has just killed Delita's sister, and in a sickening realization, we see that Argath was right all along. The life of one commoner did not stop the march of an army. Now this is the only part of the story where I just never understood why, and I don't think anyone does. I don't want to spoil the game too much here, but let me tell you, Zalbag is a homie, alright? And this act is just too hard to even try to explain or come up with some sort of logical reason for what just happened. He knows who Teacher is and has even been shown to care for her before. When we saw her introduced, together with even Zalbag himself, he explicitly speaks kindly of her to Delita of all people. And when she got kidnapped, he acknowledges it pretty somberly like, yeah, that's pretty bad. And here we see the fucking guy who brought her to her death in the first place show more emotion than Zalbag upon seeing her just killed by Argath. His next words do not even mention Titra and he leaves to go find Wegraf in his remaining fourth, leaving Argath to finish off Fort Zykadin. But the only issue is, he will not find any help from Ramza, and most certainly not Delita. The only way this fight can end is with Argath dead. I start this fight with an absolutely diabolical 4 kill move using the shockwave skill from the monk and I was pretty proud of that. There's a lot of great dialogue between Ramza and Argath that happens here. It mostly shows how different their worldviews are, despite being in a very similar place in said world. I think the best one here is what he says if you ended up not choosing to rescue him in the second fight. He calls us out for not giving orders to rescue him as a priority, comparing it to him shooting Delita's unarmed sister under Zalbag's orders, as if it's even remotely the same thing. If Delita is damaged enough during this fight, Ramza will make note of this and show concern. And at this point, Delita is so mad, mad at what his family just did to his sister, that he pretty much says he's next in line after Ergath is dead. By the end of this fight, I allow Delita the final blow to end the sad sop that is Erga. And after this awful event, the leader does not even get time to properly mourn his sister's death. I'm sorry, Delita. The keep starts to explode, and this was the last that Ramza saw of Delita. Until we saw him kidnapping the princess. This ends chapter one and the flashback, showing us how Ramza and Delita got to where they currently are. And now we understand why Ramza was so surprised to see Delita alive, though not under the warmest circumstances. <laughs> and this is probably going to be the last of my heavily fleshed out explaining of the story and story beat events, just for the sake of the length of this video. And this is the last time I'll recommend you play this for yourself if this looks like something you might enjoy so far. Literally drop the video and don't let me spoil this wonderful game and figure out how to play it down below Is the link to the emulator that I'm using to play that you see here And it's pretty easy to set up assuming you know how to get the game for it The other easier and simpler option is just buying the phone version 
which is surprisingly solid and it's pretty cheap for what you can get out of it and it even runs really well. Oh yeah, and you're almost like an hour into this cool video I made, so you might as well subscribe too. Thank you. With that, we are off to rescue the princess from our old friend. Along with us are some new allies, Sir Gafgarian that we saw in the beginning and Lady Agraeus, also seen in the beginning. They can whoop some real ass and they will be guests in the next few fights, but they actually won't be much help since I'm max level and I can whoop a mile more ass than they can. We also get the option to recruit some of the characters we fought alongside during the very first fight of the game, but I tell them all to hit the curb because this is a solo run. In the next fight of this chapter, we see a strange man trying to commission some loser to kill us, and after they agree, that poor bastard that just agreed to kill us realizes it includes Sir Gafgarian, but what he should be more worried about is me, cause he's level 11 and I'm level 91. This fight goes just about as expected for them. And the final guy, me and our bro Gafgarian, take turns sucking him off until he dies. After this fight, I go into the party menu and take all of the fancy gear off of Gafgarian and Agraeus and give it to me. This next encounter, we find a chocobo about to get goblin gangbanged. Due to the nature of this run, I would order against rescuing it, but this decision affects her bravely pretty negatively if you don't. So I do rescue this big yellow bird, but immediately after this fight, I send it to the curb anyway, with my bravery intact. This next scene reveals to us that we have caught up to our old friend Alita, and he seems to be in some deep shit. He is surrounded by Knights of the Northern Sky. These are the same guys we were fighting with before everything fell apart, and now they are here to rescue the princess. But, Delita is convinced that they are here to kill her instead. Then, as soon as we show up, the knight changes his tune and orders Gafgarian to kill everyone. It is revealed that Gafgarian was actually here to help see the princess abducted, and the knights are here to kill the abductor. This whole ass thing has been a ruse planned by Dysodar to make the other uh, line of the south, Galtana, look bad basically by staging a kidnapping and framing him. Delita even points this out because we know he's done this before with the Marquis and now Ramza and Delita are caught in the middle of the shit yet again. There are a lot of moving parts here, I know, but basically, Ramza won't help anyone kill Delita, because that's his boy, or a princess with that. So, now Gafgarian is no longer a bro and has been promoted to enemy status, and so is all of the northern knights surrounding us, leaving Ramza, Delita, and Agraeus to fight everyone else. With my first turn, I show Gafgarian how to suck hard like a real man, and he takes off like a loser. Here, we see that Delita also took time to grind since we last saw him. He is now able to wield Holy Knight skills, like we know Weegraf and Agraeus are able to. With all three of us, we are able to clean house pretty easily. After this uncertain meeting between old friends, we part ways, unsure what Delita is even doing or working towards. But with the princess in our care, now we have no one to turn to with both of the Lions of the South and the North, our enemy. Agraeus suggests we go to Cardinal Delacroix in Lionel Castle, and soon we are making our way to it. On our way to Lionel Castle, we see a man being chased by a bunch of guys in green, and we know the guys in green are bad, so we get ready to save this guy, and holy shit, is that a fucking gun he just used? This game has pistols in it, and even some magic ones too if you can figure out how to get them. After we rescue our homie Mustadio here, he tells us that his father has been kidnapped and he wants to see the Cardinal too. He joins us on our way as a party guest member, so for now I'm back up to two uncontrollable allies again, even though I really don't need them. On our way to the castle, we get ambushed by more guys in green, and they are looking for our new friend Mustadio. So I lay waste to them, mostly because they are wearing green, and green is my enemy. 
After this, the way to the castle is clear, and soon we are outside its gates. And these cool guys in red even let us in. Inside the castle, we see the Cardinal has a really, really interesting mustache going on, but is pretty chill and even agrees to help us and Mustadia with his father even. And then he flexes a really important item to the story. A cool rock. Like the one the green men are after from Astadio. After this, we part from Agraeus and the princess. Now that they are safe under the care of the cardinal, then me and Pistol Bro are off to the next fight to help rescue his father. The next fight comes and it starts off strong with Pistol Bro getting hella captured. And we get to meet the leader of the green guys we have been slaughtering. This guy really wants this rock. After using his father's leverage and offering to set all of us free for it, Pistol Bro tells us where this rock is located for this deal. Apparently it was just hidden behind us the whole time. So we walk over, grab it, toss it over, and in a shocking turn of events, this guy betrays us and then reveals that the Cardinal was also betraying us before we even got here since they are both working together. First it was Gafgarian, now it's both these guys. We're just getting hella betrayed out here. For this fight, I actually changed my job to the summoner class, meaning I couldn't just steamroll this fight, but I do have Tailwind in focus. After enough scampering and slaughtering, I actually learned a spell from one of the enemy summoners here, and it let me finish this fight off with a summon, so that was pretty cool. Afterwards, Pistol Bro and his father are reunited. But now that we know the Cardinal is actually a bitch with a fucked up mustache and not chill at all, we know that our friend Agraeus and the Princess might be in danger. So we hurry back to the castle. Mustadio offers to join me before I go, but it, to be honest, he kind of cramps my style. This is a one man show, and the stage is already barely big enough for me as it is. That, and if you have more than one non-guest party member, it will force you to bring another person into the fight in the form of a second squad, so we can't actually accept him or anyone optional without ruining the solo run because of this. On our way back to the castle, we actually come across Lady Agraeus getting hunted down by the dudes in red. It looks like red is getting added to the list of colors I swing at. At the end of this fight, Lady Agraeus lets us know that they are to execute the princess, and she is then able to join our party as a controllable member. I do accept her offer to join, just so I can steal her sword and tell her to hit the road, and leave the princess rescuing to the big man. Just as Agraeus said, it looks like an execution is about to happen. And Ramza has fucking zingers. <laughs> I've been trying not to point them all out, but stand down or take her place on the gallows? I feel this is better amplified by the fact he is here by himself, slinging these cold ass threats like that. But it looks like we showed up to a costume party instead of an execution. Honestly, I was just surprised to see Gafgarian not being the one to dress up as the princess. With this deception revealed, it looks like he wants the stone that Mustadio gave us, but he has one hell of a fight ahead of him if he wants it. After he sees me melt this poor bastard in front of him, he tries to hit me with that dollar store shadow blade. I'm so unbothered by this, I just go about killing everyone else while he desperately tries to suck me before we end the fight just sucking each other off. I obviously win the suck off. Sanguine sword gang for life. All my homies hate shadow blade. After this, he takes off yet again, and Ramza seemingly addresses no one. 
This is going to become more and more common as the game is expecting you to have more people than just Ramza for these fights. So you get some pretty funny moments because of it. Like our next fight when we sneak into the castle. The idea here is you need to open the gate for the rest of your party members that you would normally bring. What happens if it's just Ramza with no one to open the gate for? He looks like he's gone completely insane and is talking to no one. After this, Gafgarian makes another appearance, and we claim to no one but ourselves that we are surrounded. This is probably one of my favorite fights. This sees you dual Gafgarian cut off from your party, and if you haven't been leveling up Ramza properly, you might be in trouble here. But thankfully, all I've done this entire time is level up Ramza, so you can guess who the winner of this duel is going to be. I kill Gafgarian so fucking hard here. He instantly turns into a crystal, which is kind of terrifying in a way. I make my way to the lever to open the gate, and everyone on the other side is going to get sent to heaven very soon. Again, all that's left is corpses in my wake as I go to confront the fat man with the fucked up facial hair. And as we show up, before we can even say anything, he straight up calls our mom a hoe. <laughs> and then we see that strange rock is actually much more than just a rock. Did this motherfucker just get fatter somehow? This is where the game goes from fighting dudes and monsters to straight up slaying old gods that are demons. And this is our first demon. This fat double McDouble looking freak over here. This first turn I go straight to work, but fights like this can go a lot of ways as you can see. He puts my ass straight to sleep his first turn, and then he also puts doom on me, which means I will die in three turns. This bastard then started skipping his turns to wait this timer out, but thankfully I ended up waking up and had a whole two turns of being alive to kill him. And the way this game's AI works is kinda weird with characters that have the doomed status. They will straight up ignore you because they know you're gonna die anyway. But this can help in weird ways like here, where he doesn't even bother attacking me because he thinks I'm gonna die in two turns. But it looks like two turns is all I needed to claim victory over one of the first major bosses we will face coming forward. After this fight, I started working towards another job. One that is even more powerful than the Dark Knight, and much easier to get to. This job is called the Arithmetician, and is completely fucked. You know all those spells that cost like two or three turns, and you have to be in range to cast them, and they just kinda take a minute to actually use? What if you could cast almost all of these spells on anyone, instantly and almost anywhere on the map? and in some cases on every single person. With this skill, you can turn everyone into stone. It also works great for undead, because if you cast revive on a regular person, it does nothing. But if you're fighting a bunch of undead, it kills them instantly, leaving you unfazed. So, I spend the next few fights here unlocking this ultimate power for myself. 
And since I have sheer Hidori, it's very easy. All I have to do for most fights is sit in the corner and put my AI on Coward, and it will sit there and spam Tailwind for me. I do this for pretty much all the classes I need to level up, which is pretty much all the mage jobs more or less. I even leveled up the Bard class, which comes with an insane move 3 skill with it. With this wicked new power, I take it for a quick test run, and it works just like I remembered. Afterwards, I'm off to the next battle, and I encounter none other than the person who wrote the Durai papers, Oren Durai. This fight goes pretty good, despite Oren almost getting capped at the end by this chemist with a gun. Ramza and Oren are talking after this, and he asks us where we are going, and Ramza says we are going to the world capital as if there's anyone else in my party right now except him traveling around at this point. Maybe he means we as in me and you as the viewers of this video. Has Ramza gained sentience? I think the dimensional merge is happening guys. At the royal capital, we see Ramsay telling his sister some scary shit is happening behind the scenes of everything, and not long after, a pissed off priest shows up and we learned that Ramsay has been labeled a heretic for killing that cardinal with a fucked up mustache that turned into an even more fucked up demon. So now we can safely add the entirety of the church more or less to the list of people we swing at now. For this fight, I had the orator job skills on, so I managed to use the entice ability, which has a low chance to instantly turn an enemy unit onto my team permanently, the winning team. So I got this knight to join my side with a 31% chance. I didn't consider this ruining my solo run, since I actually can't control this unit until the fight is over, so they're essentially just a guest member. I then did it again to another knight who also joined me. Then out of nowhere, this priest guy starts to, what I can only assume, start taking a dump mid fight. I put a stop to that and he takes off just as constipated as before since I failed to properly smack the shit out of him. The aftermath of this fight sees Ramza's sister join us temporarily, but she will not participate in any more battles even as a guest. After the fight, the first thing I do is kick those suckers to the curb that I recruited in the middle of the last fight, after stealing all their shit of course. And then, I get an awesome idea. Like a really awesome one. You know how the game doesn't let you buy the end game gear? Until, well, you're in the end game, no matter your level? Well, since I'm level 99, and the random encounters have a chance to have human enemies that are also level 99 and packing in-game gear, what's stopping me from recruiting one mid-fight and stealing all their shit for myself? Not a goddamned thing. I quickly find a random battle that has knights in it, and I have one join me. And just like that, I have a full set of in-game gear after stripping it off the loser that I convinced to join me. And now, Ramza is somehow even meaner than before. I don't take no shit from anyone. Ramza, determined to get to the bottom of what's going on with these stones, finds himself back at Arboon Monastery, the same place we started the game at. Now, with the knowledge that it holds a stone within its walls. But it looks like someone beat us here first, and concerningly, they too are searching for such a stone. After leaving our two stones with Ramza's sister for safekeeping, we head downstairs where we see some of the search party that is on the hunt for the stone that we are, and will soon be turned into corpses. For this fight, I brought the summon ability in, so I can use some of the flashiest moves in the game and also to smoke these idiots for the crime of breathing air near me. I casually summon a dragon that somehow fits in this basement we're in, and it proceeds to laser everyone into dust. After that, we find ourselves farther down into the basement, and we see a man belonging to the Templars that besiege this place. Despite talking big game, he has no clue what is about to happen to him and everyone else in this room. With the arithmetic skill, my first turn I make everyone confused so they start attacking each other because I think it's funny. 
After a full turn of everyone attacking each other for my entertainment, I also decide to make them all go berserk too. So, now everyone is confused and angry, <laughs> which is funny. Sadly, this summoner can't actually attack his own allies because he might be confused, but the deities he summons are not, which is a nice attention to detail I guess, so his magic does nothing. Next, I think it would be best if everyone was blind, so I do just that, robbing all of my playmates of sight, leaving most of them still confused, berserk, and now blind, which is hilarious. Now that this room is looking like a special needs class with no tard wranglers, I also make everyone undead, because I can. I also then cast holy, which they really don't like for some reason. So much so, that this ends up killing most of the opponents in the room. Did I mention that this skill set is fucking busted? I end up getting lonely with most of my new friends gone, so I decided to bring one of them back. But, for some reason, he was not so grateful for my mercy, because immediately he started to cast something nasty at me. After re-unaliving him again, my luck seems to improve, since three of the guys I turned undead and then blasted with holy magic self-revived, since they were undead. And with that, I have more friends again and my loneliness fades. Now, I noticed all my homies that just got back up were at low health, so I knew just what I had to do and I decided to heal all of them. But I forgot something critical. Since they're still undead, my healing magic actually damages them, so my bad guys. After that, I'm pretty much done with the rats in my experimentation tank, so I end the fight. But the biggest rat ends up escaping with the stone as well. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. So much so that after this terrifying display, I actually had the next 44 minutes of my footage corrupt itself, where it froze on the saving screen here. Thankfully, I noticed after 44 minutes, and uh, I went to ba back to replay and record most of it. Sadly, I did accidentally leave some of the beginning of this next fight out since I hit record late, so... Basically, Ramza's sister just got kidnapped while I was doing all that fucked up shit down there in the basement. And uh, most importantly, Weegraf is back, and uh, he's still just as pissed as before, ready to kill us for killing his sister, now donned in gold and red armor. Thankfully, me and we here are very much the same, and I know he can't use his sword skills without a sword, just like I can't. So the first thing I do here is break this sore loser's sword, leaving him useless the whole fight. It doesn't take long for me to do what I do best and clean house with all of Weegraf's, actually all of Weegraf's all female compatriots here now that I've noticed. Actually, the last fight when we fought him with Delita, all of his uh, all of his allies were female there too. What did they mean by this? He also manages to hit a mean ass phoenix down here that was on a different level seeing how it went through the fucking floor here. <laughs> After I tear off his clothes and then blast him bareback style with the utmost disrespect, he teleports away. Why does everyone keep teleporting away from me? Outside, we see Weegraf actually didn't teleport as far as we thought since we see him fucked up on the ground outside. Most likely due to my bareback blast where I tore off his clothes. He is left behind by our sister's kidnapper. In his final moments, the stone he carries makes itself known, and just as we saw with the Cardinal, Weegraf transforms. And before we can fight him, he runs like a wimp again. Why are you running? Why are you running? With Weegraf gone, Elder Simon emerges from the monastery, gravely injured, to, to give us a book. It's a book that shows the true nature of the stones, and, by proxy, the church's true intentions as well. With this final deed done, our, our homie Elder Simon dies, and Ramza says, Elder Simon, no. As soon as we leave, we are approached by a man and daughter, and if we ever want to see our sister again, we are to go to a castle and deliver the book that the elder just gave us. 
Doing just that, on our way to said castle, we run into the same man having an altercation with his own sister, and it gets heated. So heated, he ends up slapping her. And I don't condone violence against women, especially pretty ones, so of course, we agree to help this damsel that is distressed by five fingers. I start this rescue by immobilizing everyone, and then promptly confusing them all, giving them a healthy dosage of poison, and then turning a few to stone before cooking the rest with superheated flares. With that, the rescue is complete. While we are chilling and getting things explained to us, we are approached by a frog, or actually by Marok, who apparently has come here to threaten us to come to the castle using our sister's leverage. Here is another fat singer from our boy Ramza though. Marok says, Terry here, and you next meet your sister in the afterlife. Ramza with his huge balls says, harm a hair on her head and I'll have you there for company. <laughs> what a giga chat. Obviously, we make our way to the castle, and the welcome mat is already rolled out for us, and it lets me make a risky teleport right into this fool's cheeks, and after I give him a good smack, just like he did to his sister, he flees, with his sister after him, leaving me to clean house again. Or, technically, this is like the front yard, so... Technically, leaving me to do yard work, you could say. Once inside, we are given an option to save. This save point is infamous for killing entire playthroughs because if you're like me and like, I don't know, probably a, a huge percentage of human beings and only have one save and override it here then proceed to get stuck here because you didn't level up Ramza enough meaning you have next to no chance of beating this next fight then you are stuck doing this absolutely brutal 1v1 feral duel against a familiar enemy and your only option is to start the whole game over with your ruined save because who? It definitely didn't happen to me. And that enemy we see is Weegraf, more than ready for round three. And this time he even wisened up. He has safeguard, meaning we can't just break his sword again, leaving us to fight him one on one. After beating him in one turn, we see another reason that broke the saves of many players. Here, we fight our second demon, and it won't be easy. Behind us, we hear the door open, where our allies would come through to help us, if we had any. This asshole still thinks we have backup though, so he summons backup of his own still. But all I have is being level 99, and my autism to assist me in besting this old enemy of ours. Right off the bat, I start trying to turn his backup band into stone, and I get all of them but one, and then I flee into the corner. But this was not enough, since he still is able to hit me with Confuse, and just like that, I don't have control over Ramza anymore. Surprisingly, he did manage to kill a demon on his own, but after that, uh, I got turned straight into stone. On my second attempt here, I take a more direct approach by casting Holy on everyone, and apparently his backup demons and all of these types of demons are straight up immune to Holy. Third attempt, I cast Confuse and I only get one of them, and then I hide in the far corner. For some reason, I get another turn in a row, so I'm able to cast it again after getting the other two I missed during the first try, turning our friend's whole team against him temporarily. With what was Weegraf approaching, I figure out Flare does work against these abominations, and his next turn, he just might turn me to stone, so I decide to take a direct approach. Then my demon bro straight punches him in the kidney for me. Then our enemy starts to cast what I can only assume to be 100 years of something in your eye where you can't just pick it out, but every time you think you get it out, it's uh, it, it, it starts uh, bugging you again. It's some iteration of that. 
trying to get closer to him. My teleport with an 80% success fails, leaving him out of range of my sword skills. With no option to actually hit him, I brace for impact. Thankfully what he casts here doesn't do a lot of damage actually. Demon Bro gets another hit in, and I cast Flare again, leaving me close to victory. Then for whatever reason, I, I think he straight up skips his turn here, and I, I don't have any clue why he did it, but it looked like he skipped his turn. Maybe this demon hitting him in the back gave him PTSD from that time when I tore his clothes off and gave him the meanest back bombing he had ever received in his life. Regardless, this lets me hit him with a mean holy cast, and with that, this chump is turning back into a rock, ending our fight and our rivalry. Afterwards, it seems our sister gets kidnapped again, and while we're searching for her, Ramza finds himself on the roof, where some shit is going down. After this, this guy gets thrown off the roof by this babe, and we see that Bargain Bin Sephiroth makes a return with said babes. It's hard to know this, but it's something you can read in the tavern. The tavern has a bunch of stuff you can read, and it has an article saying that he gets killed. So seeing him here means this is not the same Marquis that we rescued all that time ago, and even Ramsay catches on to this. It's like watching your friend die, and then he shows up to your house the next day. You know something's wrong. Refusing to give this long-haired gigolo our stones, I chase him off the roof, causing him and his battle babes to flee. But before he runs, he tells us to go to another castle if we want to see our sister. And of course, we are on our way to yet another castle to whoop more ass, probably. On our way to the next castle, we are confronted by another Templar Knight of the Church. And uh, she is no pushover, but she does have a cool sword. And I think I really want it, so... I think I'm about to steal! After snatching that shit out of her hands, I almost get cooked. And then, I, I never knew this, apparently she can use her knight's sword skills without a sword. They don't do any damage, but it still broke my armor, which sucks. I take the loss of my armor and give this lady the suck, and she flees just like they all do. Further along my way, I think it would be really, really funny if I won the next battle without actually killing anyone myself. To achieve this, I use the speechcraft skill to simply tell everyone that they're going to die, and this does actually work. Well in three turns. Slowly but surely, I convince all these soldiers that they are going to die, and they do start dying. Then I run into a huge issue. One of the knights has a ring that prevents doom, the thing that is causing all these guys to get killed. So almost, almost, I win a whole fight only by telling people that they will die. I do the next best thing I can do and turn this last guy into a literal chicken by intimidating him and I proceed to deep fry him. Now ask yourself this, is it considered cannibalism if someone eats him? Next, we are given, quite possibly, the strongest character in gaming history, Thunder God Sid, also known as Count Orlando. I won't go too into this, but this dude is bad. So bad he can wipe any battle going forward straight out of the box. At this point, if you have him and use him, the, the rest of the game plays itself for the most part. There's a reason he has the word God in his title, because he is one. He even comes with a fucking Excalibur. Hmm, the Excalibur. 
Yeah, you know the drill by now. I steal his shit and send him straight to the retirement home. Upon reaching the home of Discount Sephiroth, I'm about to do the most impressive thing in this whole run. This fight has you get ambushed by these two babes, and they know a spell that only Ramza and a few others can learn if he's a squire when it hits him, if they decide to actually use it, and if he survives it. There's one slight issue though. This is hard as fuck to do even with a full team. And it's all for a really weak spell so the payout is pure bragging rights and uh, that's pretty much it. Which is why I want it so bad. I can kill all these other demons if they don't turn me to stone. But as soon as I do too much damage to one of the babes here, the fight ends making it just that much harder. Ramza says we've walked into a trap. I can only assume he is referring to each of his huge nuts for even trying this. I do have a plan. Uh, it's not a good one. The first attempt goes about as well as expected and I get turned into stone before I can really do anything. The second attempt I get charmed by one of the babes, which has the same result of me dying. Fourth attempt again, turned to stone. Fifth attempt I was actually stopped, turned into a frog, and then killed. Six attempt, I accidentally cast holy on one of the babes when I wasn't paying attention. Seventh attempt, I actually managed to turn all the demons into stone, and then by some miracle, I got both of the babes immobilized without getting killed, leaving them with one option of attack, that being the ultima spell. And sure enough, once I got into the correct range, I managed to learn the ultima spell solo with Ramza, and man, that was, that was a lot of effort. After that, I nuke this whole map with Holy, and I claim victory along with my new spell. Once inside the castle, we see that great value Sephiroth and his ladies of the night, as they may be, are ready to throw down. Since they didn't learn their lesson from before, I cast Holy on these lowly wenches, and I actually cast it on everyone, including myself. Since now that I have that Excalibur sword, casting Holy on me actually heals me due to the sword's absorbed holy property. So, in a lot of cases, I'm now able to safely attack everyone on the map and heal myself. Because why not? Then, one of the battle babes transforms and... And now she's much hotter. After hitting me with some spooky ghost, I hit him with a black hole and with excellent judgment, he runs off like a little baby. Into the basement actually, and tells me to follow him down there. After chasing him down here in this basement, sarcophagus, graveyard place, it's uh, it gets pretty spooky as you can see here. And what's more, it looks like we're gonna see what our third demon we need to slay looks like. For this fight, we also have backup from that lady we stole the sword from as well. My first turn, I get rid of a chunk of the undead in this room by casting the revive spell. After this, I try and run, but my teleport fails and I'm put straight to sleep for it. I think I'm about to sleep! But thankfully, Skelebro comes up behind me and gently wakes me up. Once I wake up, I analyze the nature of this room, and I decide slinging holy like a madman is the best course of action, and uh, this dude is eating it like a damn champ for being a, an actual skeletal unholy demon. My new friend here gets too close and gets stop put on her, so there goes my assistance for the rest of the fight. Finally, I cast gravity on this guy, and uh, it does a ton of damage. So that's one more demon turned back into stone, finishing the fight. After this fight, our new friend tells us something very, very troubling. Recently, our brother Dysodarg was given one of these stones, and as we have seen the whole game, we know that that is not good news in the slightest. We make our way all the way back home, and as soon as we get there, uh, there are some signs of shit going on before we even enter the next room here. 
Once inside, we see our brothers fighting each other. Zalbag seems to have come to a conclusion, and we are to assist him in this against Dysodarn. After putting down the more deceitful and power-hungry brother, we see that indeed he did possess a stone, and he now makes for our fourth demon that needs slaying. What's up, fuckers? I hit him twice, run off, cast slow on him, and wipe the floor with him before he can even touch me, leaving yet another stone in our possession and another abomination slain. With the only place we know to go to now, we head to the church's headquarters, where the men that have been pulling the strings this whole time stand before us as we negotiate our sister's release. And in a shocking turn of events, we are betrayed as soon as we hand over the book that they have been trying to get from us this whole time. After killing two-thirds of them, they all run away like the cowards they are, and farther in the church, we see that not even the High Confessor was spared from their treachery. With his last breath, he tells us where these men have gone, and soon we find ourselves heading back to Oroboon Monastery to put an end to this madness once and for all. But first, we have a huge, huge side quest to complete. If you go over here into the city, a special cutscene will play and it will let you go into a secret dungeon afterwards. There are 10 floors for you to battle through, where the strongest and toughest enemies in the game live, and where the best loot can also be found. At the end, a special boss awaits you here too. where you can learn a special summon spell from him, much like the Ultima spell we learned and uh, I want that shit. The tricky part here is each floor has a randomly selected tile out of about a dozen different spots where you need to step on it for a chance to proceed farther in the dungeon, and even then it's not guaranteed. Well I don't think so anyway. So if none of them activate, you have to do the whole floor again until you get the message telling you that you found a passage. But what about the loot? There are also more specific tiles that hide loot, where if you move on top of them, you get a chance to either get something really dumb, or something really, really good. Thing is, if you get the dumb thing when you walk over this tile, the good item is gone forever. Which sucks for people that don't know that beforehand. So it's an instant reset, meaning we also have to start the floor over again. So with all that out of the way, we go down to the first floor, and we noticed everything is level 99, and everything is also pitch black. For most players, this is the hint that this place is fucked. Alright, 10 floors, let's go. I make my way to the bottom of the first one, and on about the third trip down, I get lucky. Assuming I get the passage trigger on my second try on all these, I only have about 20 battles to fight at best. The second floor is very, very special. Why is that? Well, it has level 99 ninjas in it sometimes, and uh, well, they can throw some pretty interesting things. Like, uh, what if I told you they threw the strongest weapon in the game at you sometimes, and uh, I don't know, it's called the fucking Chaos Blade? Knowing this, how I always get my Chaos Blades, I re-roll this fight until one of them spawns a ninja that throws one of these Chaos Blades at me. I also go in with a skill that lets me catch them when they're thrown at me, and... Boom. You can get infinite Chaos Blades this way, but I only need two at most. Just when you think I can't get any stronger, I find a damn way. I'm like, I'm basically like, I'm like Goku basically. With my new swords of absolute diabolical destruction and power, I make my way further into the depths. On my third floor, I actually get pretty lucky and find the passage the first try after I make my way to the correct tile. Down to the fourth floor, it took quite a few tries, but 
I ended up getting the passage here to trigger as well. Now on floor 5, I got it first try thankfully, and only about an hour and a half in, I'm halfway done through this madness. But floor 6 was not so merciful. It took the longest of all the floors with a whole 8 attempts to get past it, so I spent a good few battles on that one trying to progress. I did use the fly movement ability when I was getting bored and <laughs> look how goofy this shit looks. I did, finally, finally get past this one. Down all the way on floor 7, I throw a javelin at some poor bastard and I get the passage to trigger first try. Now on the 8th floor, I manage to get to the passage, and I also make sure to pick up this lordly robe on the same attempt, which was actually amazing luck. Moseying over to floor 9, I pick up my neat little helmet, and for the second time, my footage absolutely shits the bed here. While I did get my helmet, I did also get the passage too, as you can barely hear through this garbled mess. But yeah, thank god I caught it before I actually started the last fight here, and I was able to fix it. With our close call over with, I change my job to the summoner so I can learn the spell, and we find a pretty cool mage that lives in this cave. And what's more, he has a pretty cool stone, and here is our secret demon boss. I like to think the huge snake this guy carries is kinda symbolic about how huge of a cock this guy must be packing to live in a cave like this. We also get a cool, purple, unique recruit out of this fight, a little demon of our own, but I'm not interested in him, this being a solo run, so I turn him into a stone just like the rest. With everyone out of the way, I wait for the summon to be cast on me so I can learn it. And... I get absolutely fucking eviscerated from the face of this planar realm. I thought I could survive this attack with all my magic defense stuff, but uh, it looks like that isn't cutting it in the slightest, so it's time to try plan B. Plan B is a cool ability that lets your current magic act as a shield, so it takes damage for you in place of your health if you have any magic. With my new strategy, I attempt the fight again, looking to learn this summon for myself. And after turning all these losers into stone again, it's time for the moment of truth. With the mana shield ability, I survive and learn the spell I came looking for. And, to my complete surprise, I cast gravity on this dude, and it does a fat 999 fucking damage for some reason. I guess I casted it on his snake. <laughs> it must be his weak point. With that, we're in the home stretch. I have done some of the hardest tasks this game has to offer solo. Now, with only one place to go, I'm back to my way to Arboon Monastery. We make our way down further into its depths, and we see that the Templar's lackeys have beat us here. They're probably because I just spent an in-game month charging through a dark cave to beat up some snake wizard. As you could expect, the poor fodder that guards this room has zero chance of stopping me, so long before I extinguish all life that this room holds. In the next room, we see a large sigil has been disrupted on the floor, and a familiar enemy awaits us. Wielding the awesome power we plundered from the depths, I deep clean this dirty Templar from the fight before he can even touch me. In a last ditch effort, 
he dramatically sucks us into another dimension using the sigil on the floor. And then, just to be an asshole, he destroys our only way out, trapping us in this dimension. So, we forge on into the new world we find ourselves in, and not far out, we encounter another of the Templars and his own entourage of troops. They actually get the better of me here by breaking my armor and casting a spell I can't dodge, so uh, I actually died in this fight. In the second round, I get straight into business and cleave this guy in absolute half, and wisely, Everyone decides that they don't want any of that smoke and the damage it brings to their emotional health after seeing that. Next fight near the end, we find ourselves getting shot at from across a chasm and getting stared down by hydras. But the side I'm standing on has a much scarier enemy on it. Me. I realize I could be in trouble here, as this next Templar has a gun and can immobilize and disable me from afar if I'm not careful. But I have a plan for him. In the beginning here, he does end up disabling me, and then this Hydra gets the worst RNG roll ever and misses all three of its flame attacks here, which is pretty funny. After that I enable scamper protocols, and I try to wait out the disable so I can start actually killing things. As soon as I get over my disability, I cook the chemist, then the Hydras, and the behemoth, leaving just me and the pistol man. My plan here is to kill him with the Ultima spell, and the damage this spell does is kind of doo-doo. And this guy also has life font, meaning every time he gets a turn, he's able to move and heal, which is about how much damage I do with this spell. But I did manage to slowly whittle him down over many, many casts. Next up is the final battleground, and the man believed to be the leader of all those guys I just mega unalived. Here we fight our final demon of the stones. He is looking for blood to spill to awaken their leader, but he can try if he wants to, because I don't plan on making it easy for him. I cast a mean gravity spell on him, and I use my trusty Sanguine Suck to do a devastating 999 damage thanks to the Chaos Blade I'm wielding, and in two turns, the last of the Templars are no more. Taking our sister as its vessel, seemingly facing resistance, the two split into separate beings, one back into our sister, and the other as the deity they have been trying to summon, Saint Ajora. But soon she takes another form. Just like in the beginning, we are against unfavorable odds but at this point, we are well tempered against it.
The first attempt actually doesn't go that well. Like at all. The second attempt here I take a more direct approach and it has a much better effect, beating the final boss. Or so we think. Something kinda crazy happens. She somehow gets hotter. <clears throat> Immediately, I start swinging like my life depends on it. After two whole turns of double attacks with my OP swords, this beast is still standing and this left me very worried. As I should be, I do not survive against its first active turn and I am turned into a statue instantly for my troubles. You know, at this point, it would be really funny to have a fucking 3D printed statue of a, of Ramza turned to stone on my desk. Just for how many fucking times I've been turned to stone by this shit I fight. After making my way to the second attempt again, it kind of starts the same and instead of getting turned into stone, I'm confused, losing control over Ramza, and then I'm turned into a frog. Round 3, I get my two double attacks in, and this time, they miss their spell cast. So, I get another turn in, and after a third double attack, this thing is still not dead somehow. It starts charging up a spell, of what I can only assume to be wet socks and itchy balls for one billion years, and in my next turn, I gotta beat it, or I'm fucked. And my next and final turn of the solo playthrough, I deliver the blow that sends this unholy spawn back to whatever hell it got summoned from, claiming victory and beating this game solo. kill myself let's see if I'm pretty sure this heals him and hurts me yep I'm about to die <laughs> there I am face down in the water guess who's getting max level gear by uh, using the orator skill to recruit them steal their shit and then dump them on the street Ah, uh, you sick puppy Oh, man. I'm so dead. <laughs> 